Hello everyone, welcome to ZR Well, where we explore the fascinating world of language and literature. Today, we dive deep into the origin of language, uh, a topic filled with interviewing theories and hypotheses based on the chapter number one of George Ewell's The Study of Language. We will explore the various ideas that attempt to explain how language came into being or how language was originated. Let's get started. The origin of language has been a subject of speculation for centuries and despite numerous theories, the exact process of language development remains a mystery due to the lack of direct evidence. In this lecture, we will explore some of the most prominent theories that have been proposed over time. First of all, we have Darwin's musical hypothesis. Charles Darwin, who was uh, or who gave the idea or theory of evolution in 1871, he suggested that the early ancestors of humans may have used musical notes and rhythms as a form of communication, possibly to attract mates before they developed the power of articulate speech. This hypothesis introduced the idea that music and rhythm could be the precursor of language. Now let's have a look into his statement that what exactly he said. So he said that the suspicion does not appear improbable that the progenitors of men, either the males or females or both sexes, before they had acquired the power of expressing their mutual love in articulate language and they were to charm each other with musical notes and rhythm. This statement is considered to be true and uh, a relative one but still it is a hypothesis and not a theory because there is no evidence that can support the statement one of the oldest theories is the divine source theory which suggests that the language was a gift from a divine entity according to biblical account in the book of Genesis, it is stated that God created Adam and gave him the ability to name all living creatures. There is a similar concept in Islam where Allah Almighty created Adam uh, as a first human. Then he uh, then taught him the name of all the things. So whatever he called a thing, that was the name thereof. Then we have Hindu tradition, according to which Saraswati, wife of Brahma, brought language to humanity throughout history rulers like Pharaoh Maticus and king king james IV of scotland then mughal emperor akbar the great they all conducted experiments to rediscover this original divine language so uh, see what exactly they did first of all we have experiment of Pharaoh Maticus. The Greek writer Herodotus reported the story of an Egyptian pharaoh named Smaticus or Smatic who tried the experiment with two newborn babies more than 2500 years ago. After two years of isolation except for the company of goats and a mute shepherd, the children were reported have, uh, to have spontaneously uttered not an Egyptian word but something that was identified as the Phrygian word because meaning bread. Then the pharaoh concluded that Phrygian, an older language spoken in the part of what is modern Turkey, must be the original language. Uh, the seem very unlikely that the children may not have picked up this word from any human source, but as several commentators have pointed out, they must have heard what the goats were saying. Now, uh, if you remove the ending of this word Becca's cause, and only uh, there is only left the word be, B E, as we pronounce it in the word bed, be, be. This is uh, what a sound, uh, uh, what a goat sound like, and you can hear a goat. Did you get it? Then we have experiment of King James IV uh, of Scotland who carried out a similar experiment around the year 1500 and the children were reported to have spontane spontaneously started speaking Habdi, confirming the king's belief that Habdi had indeed been the language of Gordon of Eden. Uh, 
about a century later the mughal emperor akbar the great also arranged for newborn babies to be raised in silence only to find that the children produced no speech at all so these were the three major experiments that had been conducted in the history and uh, their results vary from each other after this we have the natural source uh, natural sound source theory according to this the human auditory system is already functioning before birth like at the um, around at the age of 7 months and that early processing capacity develops into an ability to identify sounds in the environment allowing humans to make connection between a sound and the thing producing that sound this leads to the idea that primitive words derive from imitation of the natural sound that early men and women heard around them we have uh, two theories regarding this concept which are the bawao theory and the pupu theory the bawao theory says that when different objects flew by may uh, flew by making a kaka or kuku sound the early humans try to imitate the sound and then used them to refer to those objects even when they were not present all modern languages have some words with pronunciation that seem to echo naturally occurring sounds and this phenomena is called onomatopoeia so onomatopoeia is a term that is used for words that imitate that imitate the sounds they describe in english in addition to kuku we have splash bang boom rattle buzz hiss screech and of course bawow as um, onomatopoeia then pupu theory this theory proposed that a speech developed from the instinctive sounds he, people make in emotional circumstances for example ouch came to have a, a painful connotation then a u f u w o w or y a k these are also the examples of uh, such instinctive sounds but uh, these are usually produced with sudden intakes of breath which is the opposite of ordinary talk like when we speak uh, normally we exhale not inhale so this word would seem to be rather unlikely candidate as a source of sound uh, for language production social interaction theory also known as yo he ho theory This theory proposes that language originated from sounds made during physical efforts particularly when coordinated between several people such as when lifting heavy objects in a group so a group of early humans might develop a set of hums grunts groans and curses that were used when they were lifting and carrying large weights of trees or lifeless hairy mammoth here in the picture you can see a huge lifeless hairy mammoth so this is how it looked like so whenever they uh, worked in a groups uh, to lift it up they might have produced certain sounds that were then that led to the production of language the appeal of this proposal is that it places the development lang- of language in a social context that when people worked in society or communicated with with each other in the society or had societal interactions they developed speech or language physical adaptation theory uh, suggests that physical features that may have supported speech production in early humans such as the transition to upright posture with bipedal locomotion bipedal locomotion is something uh, when you talk on, uh, when you walk on two feet which allowed for long articulation through uh, on outgoing breath here in this picture you can see an upright posture and this help for long articulations uh, which lead to the uh, production of larynx and pharynx among four leg creatures the rhythm of breathing is closely linked to the rhythm of walking resulting in one pace one breath relationship but among two leg creatures 
the rhythm of breathing is not tied to the rhythm of walking allowing long articulations on outgoing breath with short in breaths it has been calculated that humans breathing while speaking is about 90% exhalation with only about 10% of time saved for quick in breaths uh then other uh, physical changes also played a vital role in the language production uh, if we see the reconstructed vocal tract of nindhartal man nindhartal man is a transitionary form between man and apes now if we see the vocal tract of them from around 60000 years ago it suggests that the sum const constant like sound distinctions were possible at that time in those men then around 35000 years ago we start to find features in fo- fossilized skeletal structures that resemble to those of modern humans uh this was also somehow a part of darwin's evolutionary theory because he suggested that uh, man uh, is a, an evolutionary form fr- which was evolved from apes then the lip mouth tongue larynx and pharynx these are those physical structures that are vital or significant in sound production let's have a look into the teeth and lips mm-hmm. human teeth are upright and of even height unlike apes like apes they don't have even teeth and human teeth are useful and human teeth are useful for making sounds like f or b in this picture you can see that how our teeth are playing their role uh, in producing the sound f your even teeth when they touch your outer lower lip and uh, there is a, f- a fricative lip movement the sound f is produced f then human lips have uh, more complex muscle interlacing other than uh, interlacing than other primates which aids in creating sounds like p b and m if you try to produce this sound p b m your lips the touch each other and the sound is produced if we see in fans the b and m sounds are the most widely attested in the vocalization made by human infants during their first year no matter which language their parents are using then mouth and tongue the human mouth is small and can open and close rapidly with an l shaped ex- uh extended vocal tract in this picture you can see uh the picture uh, here given you can see the l shaped vocal tract then human have a thicker more muscular tongue that can shape a variety of sounds human can also close off the nose to create more air pressure in the mouth uh our nasal cavity it is connected with our throat and we can close the air off in the nose to make pressure in the mouth and produce certain sounds uh, nasal sounds these differences allow for a face with intricate muscles interlacing in the lips and mouth capable of a wider range of shapes and more rapid delivery of sound larynx and pharynx human larynx also known as voice box is posi- positioned lower than that of other primates due to the assumption of an upright posture This carries a long cavity called the pharynx that acts as a resonator for increased range and clarity of the sound produced via the larynx. However, this also makes humans more likely to choke on food. Like uh, you can't talk and eat at the same time. If you try to do so, you choke on your food. Although the primates do not suffer from this pro- uh, problem, they also lack the extra vocal power and range of sounds that the human pharynx provides then uh, the tool making source the physical adaptation we suggest that uh, speech sounds were produced using anatomical features previously used for the purpose other purposes such as teeth and lips used for chewing and sucking respectively 
A similar development is believed to have taken place with human hands, and some believe that mutual gestures may have been a precursor of language. By about two million years ago, there was evidence that humans had developed pref preferential right-handedness and had become capable of making stone tools. Tool making or the outcome of manipulating objects and changing them using both hands is the evidence of brain at work. Uh, we'll study the human brain under the, for under the heading of tool making source. So in this picture, you can see our brain with distinguished left hemisphere and right hemisphere. The human brain is not only large, but also lateralized with specialized functions in each hemisphere. The areas controlling vocalization and tool manipulation are close together in the left hemisphere, suggesting an evolutionary connection between language and tool use. A recent study of stone cutters found that brain activity during tool making and thinking about specific words was similar, suggesting language structure may have developed through the same circuits as two handed tool creation. This suggests that humans may have developed language by repeatedly making specific sounds or noises, which gradually evolved to, into more complex messages as people combined and reframed them over the time. Genetic source theory. The human baby undergoes rapid physical changes in the first few years of life. At birth, the brain is only a quarter of its eventual weight, and the larynx is high in the throat, allowing babies to breathe and drink at the same time. As the child grows, the larynx descends, the brain develops, and the child starts walking and talking. The complexity of young child's language has led scholars to look for a more powerful explanation for language than just physical adaptations. Children born deaf become fluent in sign language user, become fluent sign language users, suggesting that human offspring are born with an innate capacity of language that is generally hardwired. <clears throat> The innate hypothesis is there to support uh, genetic source theory, and uh, this theory, uh, this hypothesis suggests that language is hardwired into human genetically. Scientists have found changes in genes that could make people eat more food, and these changes might help their brain grow better. This theory moves away from physical evidence toward analogies with computer programming and genetics. The search for a special language gene unique to human is ongoing with fox p2 having a potential role in language production fox p2 you have to remember the name of the gene which is associated with the language production so each of these theories provides a unique perspective on how language might have developed while the exact regions remain uh, unknown and the ongoing exploration of this topic continues to shed light on the remarkable capabilities of the human mind. Thank you for joining me in this exploration. If you enjoyed this lecture, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to ZR Realm for more insights into the world of language and literature. Once again, thank you for watching.